Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC. Hi, everybody. Welcome once again to the noon meeting of the Road Republic of Baton Rouge. I'm Club President Haggai Davis. Uh, with us today, we have uh, John Pugh. We'll do the invocation, followed by uh, Ken Best for the, uh, the pledge and the four-way test. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to share with you a brief story uh, explanation of the small prayer that we'll use as the introduction for the invocation today. In Northeast New Mexico, there's a scout ranch run by the Boy Scouts of America that uh, encourages young people to spend a week or 10 days uh, camping and hiking in the rugged mountains of Northern New Mexico. Philmont Scout Ranch is the name of it. And at the base camp where cadets and, and campers start and end, there's a, a large mess hall and it starts every meal with this Philmont prayer for food, for raiment, for opportunities, for life, for friendship and fellowship. We thank thee, O Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we hope that the spirit of the Philmont prayer will embody in all of us so that we can make healthy decisions during these times of political and economic crisis. Grant us the wisdom and the strength to do the right things during these times of uncertainty and help us to follow the guidelines of our medical professionals so that we can not only protect ourselves, but protect others. May we have courage to follow the guidelines set by the Centers for Disease Control, and please grant to our elected officials, both local, state, and federal, the power and the authority to make good decisions to bring this tragic pandemic to an end. In doing these things, we fulfill the prophecy of being ever mindful of the needs of others. We ask this in your name, amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now join me in the four way test of the things we think say and do is it the truth is it fair to all concerned will it build goodwill and better friendships will it be beneficial to all concerned thank you uh thank you john and ken um that was great we have with us today, uh, Mr. Paul Hilliard and Stephen Watson are gonna be our speakers. We have Robert Levy, who's gonna introduce them. Robert, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you. The National D-Day Museum opened June 6th of 2000, 55 years after the war ended. It later expanded to become the National World War II Museum. It's exceptional that 20 years after the opening, and 75 years after the war ended, we have a decorated veteran of, of the Pacific and a man who joined the museum 18 years ago and is now president to share their thoughts with us. Paul Hilliard came from rural Wisconsin where his family far, farmed and in 1943, at age 17, he enlist, enlisted in the Marines. He wound up flying 45 missions in a dauntless dive bomber this two-seater plane had him facing backwards in the open air to fire machine guns and operate the radio. He spoke to us in 2013, and when he was finished, I asked him a question. How could you fire a machine gun with a windshield in front of you? And Paul, as he was on his way to his seat, said, what windshield? 
After the war, he got his undergraduate degree and law degrees and was hired by Chevron in New Orleans. While in school in Texas, he discovered that although Texas was nine times the size of Louisiana, Louisiana was nine times more interesting. Thus, he wound up starting a very successful independent oil company in Lafayette, Badger Oil. He has found time to volunteer in major ways to the benefit of many nonprofits, not the least of which is the World War II Museum. Stephen Watson joined the museum in 2002 and has worked in numerous areas that contributed to its success. He continues to keep it as a world-class attraction that honors our greatest generation. We welcome today, Paul and Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Lead the way, Paul. You're first. Mine? Okay. Well, I think uh, Louisiana turned out to be a lot more than nine times more interesting. Maybe, 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 uh, maybe 90 times more in, in ways I never dreamed of. <laughs> and so <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it's still that way. But anyway, uh, I was a kid in a, in a big war, one of 16 million Americans, one of six million volunteers. And uh, so uh, I, I did what I was I was told to do, and that, that made it easy. You get along with the Marine Corps uh, pretty well. As long as when they say jump, you just say how high, and then that's it. And I, uh, but anyway, I did what I was uh, I was told to do, and uh, I did my time overseas. And uh, when I, and now I now I read. Uh, extensively uh, about the war and I find out what we were doing, what was happening around the world. Big war, 100 million men in uniform, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 million casualties. And uh, so it was, uh, I know as I look at it now as a, as a, it was a privilege, you know, to wear, wear a uniform and fire a weapon in the war. Uh, it was a different kind of war. I think uh, at very sharp moral corners, we, we everyone knew what we were doing and why we were there, and uh, we didn't know that necessarily what we were doing, but we knew why we were there. So, the um, I, I came back in, uh, and now I, you know, seventy-five years <clears throat> after I got out of service, uh, I look back and and try to figure out what happened because it's all kind of a it's all kind of a dream. But uh, I think the 15, 16 years I've been associated with the National World War II Museum has uh, it, it's meant a lot. It's been a, it's been a great privilege, a lot of fun. And uh, uh, most of the time, uh, right now, it's not a lot of fun. We we having some pressure, as, uh, as you well know, Stephen can go into that. But anyway, I. Uh, it's a big war on it. It was on every continent, on, over, and under, every body of water, uh, a war that introduced the, the third dimension of warfare, which was uh, the air power. And uh, that uh, began with biplanes and ended with, uh, with uh, pressurized bombers at 30,000 feet delivering atom bombs. So a lot happened. Uh, during the war with uh, so with that uh, rather than just ramble on uh, uh, I'd like to hear what the audience wants to hear I'm more interested in that to hear uh, what questions do they have so fire away Stephen, did you have anything to add uh, as well before uh, we haven't really had a chance for a whole lot of questions just as of yet? Um, sure. I'm always happy to make comments. So uh, um, a few things I wanted to say. I mean, first thing I want to do is is thank my boss, Paul, for, you know, uh, his leadership at the museum. Uh, Robert did a wonderful job of describing Paul's wartime experience, but um, few have done more for the museum than 
Paul and his wife Madeline over the last 15 years. And uh, Paul was our chairman until just uh, a couple of months ago um, from 2018 through 2020. And it's really uh, a lot of our accomplishments at the museum are a testament to his commitment um, and his leadership. So um, I want to thank Paul for not only his service, but all that he has done to help the museum become the great institution uh, that it is. Um, I also want to thank Robert Levy. Robert has been a dedicated and loyal supporter of the museum for, for many years and, uh, and also to the club. Um, you have been incredibly generous over the years, giving us an opportunity to come and you know tell us tell you a little bit about our story and our progress and and we appreciate that um this is a wonderful club and i think as i recall one of the the biggest and strongest rotary clubs in the entire country and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to to come and tell you a little bit about what's happening uh, at the museum and of course baton rouge is an important community to the museum it's a great source of visitors uh, school groups um, supporters um, We've obviously had great support from the state of Louisiana um, going back to the 90s through every administration, including uh, Governor Edwards and his team. So um, we're you know, very grateful to Baton Rouge and the community and all that it has done and, and continues to do to support the museum. So just uh, a few things I wanted to mention. I'll, I'll start with the, the tough parts and I'll, I'll end with something a little more positively in terms of you know, what's happened in the last few months and, and the road ahead. Um, I, I think it will come as no surprise uh, that it's been a difficult year um, due to the, the pandemic. Um, you know, we had before the, the crisis began in March, we had had 14 years of consecutive visitation growth. Um, we had uh, welcomed over 8 million visitors. Um, we were at about 800,000 visitors a year. A majority of those folks coming from outside of the state and uh, we were continuing on a, a positive trajectory but of course uh, COVID has put a temporary pause on that momentum and and we anticipate it will be you know 18 to 24 months at least uh, before we get back to a, a full recovery so um, certainly um, being our our most challenging financial year a two-month closure uh, during the busy spring season, uh, the anticipated slow return of tourism. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you uh, in this meeting today are dealing with the same things in your own businesses and, and life. Um, but for us, it's you know already had a $25 million impact on our, our financials and, and it will be a, a tough uh, uh, drawback. Um, but we're glad to be open. Um, uh, we opened on Memorial Day. Um, there are not a lot of tourists in New Orleans at this point. We're doing about 15 to 20 percent of what we would typically uh, expect. And uh, as we have begun our new financial year, which started in July, we, we think we'll probably end up uh, at about half of what we would have anticipated. So like many organizations, we've made tough decisions. We've made budget cuts. Unfortunately, we've had to go through some layoffs. Um, and make sure that the organization endures. That's the most important. The organization must endure. Um, it will, um, just like after Katrina, uh, we will be an important part of driving um, the recovery uh, in New Orleans. And that was one of the reasons we worked hard to uh, have the opportunity to open in phase one. I was able to participate on the governor's task force. And I think we made the case that um, we can open safely we have wide open spaces we can do time tickets we can manage capacity we know how to clean we've got security um, and really there's never been a better time to visit the museum there are no big crowds um, there's plenty of space you can take your time um, so if you haven't been recently i i urge you to come and visit uh, we're doing it safely um, and really i think you can you can take your time in a way that would not have been possible um, so that's certainly a, an unintended positive of, of a, a bad situation. But um, a couple really, I think, important things that have also happened in the last few months is, um, you know, going back to the fall, we had opened um, our Hall of Democracy, um, one of the, the final parts of our expansion plan, and that houses two new entities at the museum, our Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, and our World War II Media and Education Center. And those two entities really have deepened our, our bench of historians and scholars and content experts. 
and given us new capabilities to produce um, digital content. And that has become increasingly important during the pandemic as we've essentially become a virtual organization serving students, teachers, lifelong learners um, with an array of uh, digital programs. Um, and we've literally touched millions of people um, since March. So distance learning webinars for schools, teacher training programs, daily oral history features from our digital collections, historical articles, live presentations by educators, curators, and historians. Uh, we have a great podcast right now uh, following the last months of the war and the decisions that Truman was faced with, uh, panel discussions with scholars from around the country. Um, and of course, this month, we'll have uh, a number of programs dedicated to the 75th anniversary of the end of the war, which of course will happen um, in just a few weeks. So that I think has been a real positive out of a tough situation is how our team, just like uh, educational institutions across the country, really had to pivot and think about how to serve audiences virtually. I'm, I'm really proud of the work that our team has done in the last four months. And I think that will be something that we will continue to sustain even as we come out of the, the pandemic. Um, we also have um, another uh, big year ahead of us. We will break ground in the next 60 days on the final permanent exhibition pavilion, our Liberation Pavilion, which will pick up the story near the end of the war, tell the story of the Holocaust, the end of the war, the cost of our victory, and, and really look at the legacy of the war um, through the lens of how it changed this country uh, and the world. So that will break ground and I hope late uh, September, early uh, October and, and be open in, in 2022. And we'll essentially complete the master plan and the campus um, that we uh, signed on to uh, more than 15 years ago and, and what has been a, obviously the, the driving focus of the board and, and the staff here uh, at the museum. So those are just a few things that I wanted to mention. And, and with that, I'll, I'll pause too. And like Paul said, we can answer any questions that the, the group might have. Great. The first question is from Chris Delia uh, for Paul. Uh, what theater did you serve in? Well, like, like most Marines, I went to the Pacific the first uh, by, by ship from San Diego to the Solomons and in training there and moved around a couple islands, ended up on a big island of Bougainville. And, and then they sent us uh, again by ship uh, uh, to, well, first to, to New Guinea and as a stop there for I don't know why but anyway and from there to a, a base in the western pacific and Coral Atoll where there were fleet gathered for their convoy really gathered for the invasion of, the, of Luzon the big island of the Philippines and so uh, and so we ended up in uh, on the Philippines and I uh, we flew out of uh, Luzon until uh, Manila was declared secure and then we flew down to uh, uh, pretty close to the end of the world, and Zamboanga, Mindanao, which is uh, not exactly a you know a tourist mecca, but uh, and we were there and uh, until they sent us home uh, for reassignment just uh, just before the war ended, in I think mid to late July of uh, of forty five. So that was uh, my experience. We were we were uh, marine units, dive bombing units, but uh, we had seven squadrons there but we were flying for the army flying close support support the army infantry tina holland uh left a comment for you thank you mr hilliard uh, semper fi from a fellow marine um she said though we were always the few and the proud she's very uh, sincerely humbled by your service thank you thank you um so Oh, and, and we also have another comment from Shard, Richard, uh, along the same lines, you know, thanking you for your service and, you know, lifetime debt and gratitude. Um, so thank you uh, again for you know, a lot of, a lot of our Rotarians are going to love your service. Um, so we, Mr. Um, Stephen, we have a question or uh, from Warren Burkett. Are there any plans to expand to other wars or conflicts with uh, any kind of a name change? <clears throat> no, uh, I don't think there are any plans to expand beyond World War II. I mean, I think we feel that, that that's a, a big story. Um, and uh, 
that that's our mission. I think that um, as we complete the physical campus, I think there are plans to do more to expand how we bring that story to the public, both regionally and nationally. Um, so as we are, you know, getting close to the end of the, the build out of the physical campus, what we are looking at is how do we do more to serve teachers and students? How do we have a bigger presence in higher education? Um, what are the partnerships that we can form with other organizations that will allow us to do a better job at, at making sure that you know this important event in our country's history and world history um, is not forgotten? So I think our focus right now as we, we finish building the campus is really to think about how we can expand our educational outreach, including, um, you know, taking a hard look at whether or not we may become a degree granting institution, essentially a university of our own and offer um, master's degrees in, in World War II and, and military history. So I think that's our focus right now. Um, you know, with public programs, with special exhibits, it gives us a little bit more flexibility to, to look a little bit outside of World War II, but I, I certainly I don't see any um, significant changes to our focus on the horizon. Okay, Robert Levy asked uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Paul a question. Um, assuming your pilot had to take evasive actions, how did you feel when you were in the open air? Cold. <laughs> it was, we, we usually, it's a, the Philippines weather, but like New Orleans in August, and it, uh, so you, you were pretty lightly clothed when you took off, but at about 12,000 feet in an open cockpit, uh, I have to tell you, I hated it, but I, cause I, and I, I never minded the dive. I just wanted to get down because it was, it was cold up there. And sometimes we'd circle for maybe a couple hours waiting for the assignment of targets because the ship, the planes would go down, you know, one, one at a time. And so they could observe where the bombs hit and then they'd uh, call a flight leader, I guess, and, and uh, tell them, you know, the next guy, uh, hundred yards east or west or whatever it was. So they had their own type. We had a Marine pilot always on the ground with the army and he was talking to the pilots in the, uh, in the strike force. Uh, no, I didn't like, I didn't that circling, uh, in that, in that, uh, up there in the open cockpit just uh, was one of the least enjoyable parts of the deal. But I, I, I look back on, I, I was, I was fortunate to get the assignment I did. I didn't ask for it. They, they told me that's what I was going to do. And uh, they, uh, well, I was a volunteer. I was a volunteer, but I didn't have any choice. So the, the, uh, the. Uh, you were voluntold. Yeah, right. I was. I look back. On, I, was, I, I never crawled around the mud, uh, or the coral, or the jungle, and uh, with a with a rifle. I, I was. Uh, I, I slept in a, in a, in a tent, and uh, we we flew our missions and went back so looking back on it compared to what the, some of the other a lot of the other guys did i, I, I had good duties and no, no complaints there so uh short richard asked uh, what why did you choose the marines uh as, as compared to the other services i don't know probably john no, it wasn't john wayne uh but it was uh i don't know i turned 17 in june of 42 and uh maybe a couple of weeks after the the Battle of Midway, and I, I read a lot about it and about the SPD and the Dauntless Dive Bomber, and uh, but I don't know, the, the, the Marines were appealing. I guess I thought it was a little more exclusive outfit than the Army. Plus, I had two uncles. Uh, they're already in the Army and, uh, and, and an uncle in the Coast Guard, and uh, two of those uncles had been had been based at some time during their training early in the war in, uh, in Fort Polk, and uh, and they, they condemned the army for me and Fort Polk. So the, uh, I said, there's, there's gotta be something different than this. So uh, in, uh, being a Wisconsin farm boy, I wasn't all that fond of salt water. So I, so I, I chose the Marine Corps. And, uh, but I, I think one of the things that I, I've never been able to get across, and I think it's a little bit frustrating, is that how ordinary and how normal it was to wear a uniform in in you know, 1942 to 1945. I mean, we had you know, 16 million Americans wore a uniform, and we 
we were a nation of about 132 million. So that's one out of eight. But when you take the out the women and children, that's you know, it's one out of four. And so when you end up, you got almost half of the age eligible uh, medically fit, physically fit men in America wore a uniform. So there was it was normal. I didn't know anybody that wasn't in uniform. I don't think. That's fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, Stephen, um, Marvin Borgmar is asking, um, do you guys interact with the USS Kid Museum here in Baton Rouge? We do. That's a good question. In fact, um, we actually should have had our Pelican State exhibit at the USS Kid right now. We created an exhibit um, several years ago called Pelican State Goes to War that really, I think, does a great job of, of talking about Louisiana's contribution to the war effort. Um, both on the home front and through those that served. And it's been traveling the state uh, for the last couple of years and was scheduled to actually uh, be uh, at the kid right now. I think it would have, would have opened a few weeks ago and it would have been there through September. So um, we're hopeful that that will happen again at some point uh, in the future. Um, I, I've also you know, had several meetings with their, their board and their leadership over the last uh, several years and talking about, you know, lessons learned from our experience growing the museum and, and trying to give some helpful advice and, and vice versa. So we have a good relationship. We were really looking forward to having our special exhibit be there uh, this summer. So hopefully when uh, we get a, you know, through the pandemic, we'll be able to revisit that. And that will give us a really, I think, um, you know, good anchor partnership to hopefully, you know, begin to do more in the future. And Jeff Zimmerman asked, how can we access the digital information you were talking about earlier? Yep, great, great question. Multiple ways. Um, you can um, go to our website and uh, sign up for our uh, email distribution uh, list, and you'll get uh, more emails than you may want from the National World War II Museum. Um, you can follow us on social media, um, and you can also go to our digital collections website, which is www, the number two, online dot org ww the number two online dot org that's where um, all of our digital collections exist and i think there's maybe two and a half thousand hours of uh, veteran testimony there right now and, and we're adding more literally every week but i think between signing up for our emails following us on social media and uh, going to that site you'll get a really uh, robust understanding of kind of the, the daily programming that we're we're putting out there in fact tomorrow uh, we'll have a live event with Chris Wallace, the Fox News uh, correspondent. He actually has a new book out on the last, I think, from FDR's death to the bombing on Hiroshima. Um, and our senior historian, uh, Rob Satino, will do an interview with him about his new book uh, next week. So that's just an example of the, the, sorry, tomorrow. That's an example of the type of programming uh, that we're doing. So Barbara Carey has asked, uh, what volunteer opportunities does the uh, museum have Many um, volunteers are an essential part of the museum and have been since the day that we opened. Uh, we have an active volunteer core of over 450. Um, right now, um, like everything else, we are being very careful about how we you know, bring our volunteers back into the museum. We want to make sure that we do it safely. But just about every aspect of our, our daily operations involve volunteers at guest services, docents, um, helping at our Beyond All Boundaries Theater. Um, they are throughout the campus really helping our visitors. Uh, we also have volunteers that help us with the restoration of our artifacts um, that come and work with our, our curators. Um, we have a dedicated uh, crew of volunteers that have you know put together projects like our, our PT305 boat that until very recently was operating in, in Lake Pontchartrain. Um, and again, if you go to our website, you will see there how you can sign up and, and get in touch with us to become a volunteer. But I would say the majority um, are involved in uh, the front of house uh, operations. And uh, we've had a number of volunteers from Baton Rouge. In fact, uh, a World War II veteran who passed away a few years ago, John Rogers, uh, was a dear friend of mine. And uh, he and his wife, T, would come down and, and uh, be in the US Freedom Pavilion on Thursdays, as I recall, every week. And I know that was uh, a real highlight of 
the last years of his life was coming from Baton Rouge to, to be a volunteer at the museum. And, and we still have a 25 World War II veteran volunteers at the museum uh, as well. So Mr. Hilliard, um, certainly somebody who was way too young to have any kind of knowledge of the day-to-day -day life in World War II, what was the typical day like for you while you were serving down in, in the South Pacific? Well, we had, we had six to a tent and we hired the Filipino houseboy to help do laundry and stuff like that. But it was, um, it was, it was somewhat primitive because the, not only because we were in the Philippines, but because of the Philippines had been under Japanese occupation uh, Luzon and until the army and, and until they landed in January 45 and we came just a few days after that but uh, the CBs scraped out an airfield in a rice field and we were in between uh, you know coconut uh, plantations and uh, they laid this what they called Marston matting the metal uh, strips with the uh, they would lay it down sections with the holes in it and and that's, uh, that was it, but it was, uh, we, had, we had no, no libraries and, uh, and TV. So it was, uh, at, uh, mainly it was, it was interpersonal discussion and, uh, sit around and complain about the officers and the food and everything else. And, and, uh, and, and talk about, uh, girls about which we knew very little and about the next, uh, possible beer ration, which we got once a month. And, uh, but the, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was not, it was not exactly exciting times, except when we were flying. And how often did you fly? Whenever we told, it's just, uh, being dive bombers, you had to have decent visibility, uh, or the target. And, uh, so, we flew in, in, in pretty good weather. At least we, we thought it was pretty good. We took off and didn't always end up that way, but, uh, the, uh, we just flew whenever <clears throat> they, uh, I guess the army notified them. They wanted them to uh, attack a target. And, uh, it was, uh, it's we had, we had no, we had no control or no, no foreknowledge of that. They just say you're flying today and, and they, a truck by and put you in the back end of it and go to the flight line and, uh, and sign your airplane and and go do it and uh, so it was uh, there, there was there was nothing scheduled you know about it that we, we we never knew what what day we were going to fly or where we were going but we used to we most of our missions we call us Columbus missions because when we when we when we took off we didn't know where we were going and when we we got to got to the target. We we didn't know where we were, but you know we tried to make a big mess. And when we got home, we we still we didn't know where we had been. We did it all at government expense. So we said, "Oh, the, we, the, the guys were laughing, but we refer to those as government missions. I mean, the Columbus missions." <laughs> uh, we have another question from Orvin Borgmar. Did you have any close calls? Uh, I suppose it. Uh, it, uh, you know, you, you dive from 12,000 feet, nearly, nearly vertical and, uh, start pull out at about 1500. And, uh, so, uh, between the, the I, one of the concern was, you know, we had pretty light anti-aircraft fire and, and, and Jap, uh, aircraft had been, uh, pretty much eliminated by then, but our, uh, ground fire was always interesting, but I think the, we, we flew in, uh, into some targets in some very rugged terrain, which is what we were, why we were there. We were in fact, airborne artillery and it'd been very difficult to bring up artillery because of the terrain. So we could attack it from the air. So, and, uh, I found out uh, a lot more about what we were doing after the war and reading about the, uh, the, the adventures in the, uh, in the Philippine campaign. So, but, uh, no, it's, uh, the, the, the dive bombers are unique way to do, you know, deliver bombs, uh, 
you, you don't drop the bombs, you deliver them, you take, you fly them to the target. And, and uh, what, terrain permitting, uh, we would, the pilot would bank and circle the target, and we'd strafe it. And, uh, but it, frankly, when you're, you're moving at, you know, you know, 200 knots and uh, you just dropped a series of bombs, you can't really see much of what you're doing. And so, but we strafed it anyway. And I remember one of the guys saying when he got back, he says, uh, well, I don't know what I was doing. I was, I was uh, strafing with those twin 30 caliber machine guns. And he said, I don't know, I don't know what I hit. He said, well, the, the, the guy assured him, said, look, if it's worth a bomb, it's worth a bullet. So don't worry about it, just strafe it. And so were you mostly in the Philippines or did you go through any of the other islands further up, up north? No, we just, just uh, they, they sent us home for reassignment in, uh, in July 45. And uh, mind you, the, the battle even for Okinawa was over with. So they were, they were preparing for the invasion. And uh, they flew us from, from uh, Zamboanga to Guam and I, I saw a little Guam from the air, from the, from that transport. And it was Guam's a, this pretty big island. And it was, it was military stuff. It was tents. It was uh, thousands and thousands of barrels, trucks, jeeps, uh, Quonset huts loaded with supplies. So they were, as they prepared for the invasion, but they, uh, they sent us home. And while I was home uh, on leave, they, they dropped, dropped the uh, the bombs. We didn't really know what that was at the time. Uh, but the, uh, I think the night I, I got home to Wisconsin, they dropped the second one. And a week later, the Japs uh, said, that's enough. And uh, uh, the next morning, I woke up on my mother's lawn. So I guess we celebrated. Well, that's, that's amazing to lived through all of that and, and glad you're still around to, to tell us these stories. <laughs> well, me too. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I frankly, when, I, when I'm when i uh, in New Orleans at the museum and I look up at that dive bomber, I, it's, it's, it's sort of a fantasy because it's it's so long ago. And uh, and I, I, so I, I've i been out of the Marine Corps now for what, 70, over 74 years. so. It's uh, I, I, but I have to, I have to read, read about it. Then, it, it, then it, it comes back. You know, but, uh, but it, uh, it's uh, none of it, none of it is. Uh, I didn't carry much of it with me, but I want to read about it. And, and I, when I read about it a lot, I, and it was, uh, it's very interesting time in my life. Well, I, again, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have had. Uh, both of you, you gentlemen here with us today, Any, anything um, uh, that you, or, or we just had another question from Rob Wise, uh, wants to know, do you have any favorite parts um, or places that are uh, in, in the museum? Well, I think, you know, the, the road to Tokyo is, uh, means a lot to me because that's, that, that's, that's where I served, but uh, I, uh, I, I I enjoy that, and I can I can relate to the you know the the, the jungle and and all that and uh, and the just when when the there's a there's part of the there's a part of that exhibit and it's, it must have what a 20, 25, 30 foot ceiling and it, it's so mindful of the Pacific, which seems like the Pacific is is endless. So you know a third of the Earth's surface and uh, out there they are. Everything, everything, everything was was distance. And I remember we were we were aboard ship on the way to the Philippines, and one of the guys saying, "You know, you know, find out from one of the officers what we can write to mom and tell her." And, and he, he came back and says, "He said, uh, you he said, tell tell mom uh, that you're a thousand, at least a thousand miles from where you were, and you're at least a thousand miles from where you were going, then she'll know exactly where you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But, uh, I've enjoyed the museum. I mean, that's 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 been a you know, a labor of love, and, and uh, give me give me something to do. And I think, and 
maybe Stephen was going to mention, but I want to I want to thank the uh, the state of Louisiana, which has been so helpful going back all the way back into the '90s. I guess to Mike Foster, and they they've helped us and given us seed money uh, for the buildings. And of course, then they say, well, it's like a challenge grant. They say, okay, now you go raise the raise the rest of the money and do it within a certain length of time and and uh but it's 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 been a helpful so the state of louisiana has been uh, it's been, it been very 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 good to us all right and i've enjoyed every time i've gone i i, I love going to the museum it's, it's there's always something new every time i see i'm there and just learning something about what what you you guys went through and and that's Thank you for being a part of putting it all together for us. It's uh, well, there's some challenges right now from from different directions, e economic. Yes, you know, New Orleans is a, a tourist and convention town, so it's 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 hurting right now. And then uh, the, these all these the social unrest is not particularly helpful either. So, gentlemen, is there anything um, that else that you'd like to let us know about or, or for the day? I do have a, uh, there was a couple of questions in the chat that I thought I should probably address. Um, one of them was uh, my last visit to the museum was just after the Boeing edition. You know, have there been any other editions since then? And uh, absolutely there have. Um, and, you know, since the Boeing, uh, U.S. Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing uh, Pavilion opened in 2013. We opened the road to Tokyo that Paul just talks about, um, but also the road to Berlin, which is our, our, our galleries dedicated to, you know, telling the story of the, the whole war in Europe. Uh, we also have now uh, our Arsenal of Democracy uh, permanent exhibition, which really, I think, helps the, the visitor understand how we got into the war uh, in the first place, the lead up to uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, and also an expanded uh, treatment of uh, the home front story. So we have added much since uh, 2013, and really, in, in fact, in many ways, it's like a whole new uh, museum experience. And uh, I would also just add to, to, to the question about, you know, the favorite part of the museum. I think, you know, this museum started with the, the 650 oral histories that Dr. Ambrose uh, had collected uh, as part of his uh, research and writing on D-Day primarily, and uh, you know, to this day, I think one of the signature elements of visiting the museum is how we tell the story through the the, the words and the experiences of uh, men and, and women like Paul who served. And I think if you have not visited in the last five years, um, you have not experienced what we call our dog tag experience, which is when you come to the museum and you get your ticket, you are also given a a, a little dog tag that has a, an RFID chip in it, and you begin your visit at the museum probably the same way that Paul began his journey to war, is you get on a, a Pullman train car, and you take your dog tag, and you swipe it, and you're introduced to a real person. And as you go through the road to Berlin or the road to Tokyo, you check in and find out what was happening to that person at that period of the war um, through a series of videos. You can also use that dog tag to digitally collect content as you go through the museum. And when you go home, you take that card, you type in the number to the website, you get the full story of that person's experience. You see all of the material that you collected while you were on site. And we also share with you related materials from the museum's archives. And I think it's just one of the ways that we kept these personal experiences at front and center uh, for the visitor. And I think that's one of the the things that I really love about the museum and one of the things that we get the most uh, positive feedback on. That's awesome. Well, I think, Stephen, you may, I think that the New Hall of Democracy, which opened less than a year ago, is an absolutely amazing facility. And the, the, the broadcast, the media center in that is, uh, is, is worth seeing, even though I don't understand all what they do there, but it's, uh, it's an incredible, operation that's the that's good that's the future of the museum is the educational aspect getting it online getting it out because we've had what eight million visitors and since it opened and we can accommodate about a, maybe a million a year uh comfortably but this you know 330 million people in america so we've, 
we've got to get to you. We've got to get the museum online, get the, get it out to people. Yeah. So you mentioned something about uh, the educational components of it. Are you working with any uh, specific universities to do this or? It's a great question. So we, uh, you know, we've long had a partnership with the University of New Orleans because essentially, you know, our, our founders, uh, you know, came out of the University of New Orleans and, and we continue to have a, a great partnership there. Um, we also have a great partnership with Nichols, uh, my alma mater, and uh, we offer uh, a couple of leadership programs for students um, where you can get college credit through Nichols. Um, and we also have uh, an online master's degree right now with Arizona State University. Uh, we have 200 master's students enrolled in classes right now, and we launched that program uh, about 18 months ago um, and are continuing to look at other partnerships. And as I mentioned earlier, even the possibility um, of becoming an accredited uh, degree granting institution uh, as a museum. And, and to Paul's point about the Hall of Democracy, I mentioned this earlier, but I think one of the, the, the really brilliant parts of the, the physical campus master plan was this understanding that we, we needed to have a, a place to produce digital content. We needed to have a, a significant research library and uh, to become a, a trusted source and, and to help make this story accessible, you have to have historians and scholars and experts that, that know uh, the history. And the Hall of Democracy that opened last October is the physical building where you know all of that happened. The library, the historians, the instructional designers, the distance learning experts, the media producers, um, and as I, I mentioned earlier, as we finished the campus, being really sort of strategic and thoughtful about how we scale those programs to serve students and teachers across the country, provide more access to our collections in these oral history, partner with more universities and, and other organizations is, will be an important part of our efforts and outreach, um, in addition to, of course, uh, maintaining the campus. And even today, you know, on, on average, uh, we reach almost a million uh, people per month uh, through our, our outreach programs, and that is growing uh, exponentially, and, and that will be a, an increased focus in the years ahead. So uh, we have another question from Ken Best, uh, from Mr. Paul. Where did you do your aviation training, and what was your total uh, flight hours, total number of flight hours? Well, they sent me uh, from San Diego after after recruit training and rifle range and that they sent us to Jacksonville, Florida, the Naval Air Station. We we did aviation and radio and radar school there and then gunnery school and flew, flew in uh, patrol bombers and did uh, gunnery in uh, you know, the Bahamas and Cuba and so on. Combination training flights and anti-submarine flights. And then uh, from, from there, uh, they sent us back to San Diego and and overseas, and uh, I wonder. They say, you know, someone mentioned the the atom bomb. I just finished Chris Wallace's book, which was interesting. But uh, I, uh, when when we when they sent us home in uh, in July of late July '45, uh, for they said you're going back for reassignment, and uh, we just we assumed we'd be going back to the Pacific. So that uh, needless to say, the uh, the A bombs and the uh, Japanese surrender was was welcome to those of us who just had come home and uh, thought we thought we'd have to go back. So, did you, did you receive any uh, medals for your service? And if so, how many? Well, the the Marine Corps not very romantic, but they did. They sent me a couple of the string of frying crosses and uh, some air medals after the war, and they they they, they mailed them to my. By my mother's house, and uh, so I, but they, uh, and I, I, I don't know why, but because the, the, the our air group gave the naval unit citation in both the uh, Philippine and the, uh, I mean, both the Luzon and the, and the Mindanao operations. So maybe that's why they did. I don't know. They, uh, they I didn't have any formal ceremony. They just sent them to. Me. And. Um... Stephen, there's a question, a couple of questions from Marvin about can, if you pick, can you pick someone's uh, name who may be related to you for a, de a dog tag? And also, how many people total work at the museum? 
So what was the first question again, just to me? Can you pick someone's name who you may have been related to when you're doing the, the, the dog tag? Got it. Um, no, you cannot. Um, what we have, there are 50 individuals that we selected uh, for the dog tag experience that essentially cover, you know, a majority of the different ex types of experiences that uh, happened in the war. Of course, you, know, you can't boil World War II down to 50 individual experiences, but in terms of branch of service, theater of operations, race, gender, um, it's a representative group of individuals that have great stories to tell. Um, some of these are very tough stories. Um, some of these these individuals are killed during the war, um, but you know each of them. There, there are two sets: one that relates to the European theater, one that relates to uh, the Pacific. And when you come to the museum, you are randomly assigned a person, but you can go in and actually look through the quickly. And if you see an experience that's maybe closer to your interest, you can. Uh, essentially pick that person and, and follow it. Um, how many people work at the museum? Well, that's changed a lot in the last uh, few months, unfortunately, but um, pre-COVID um, between our museum team, um, our food and beverage partners who manage those operations, and of course we have a brand new uh, Higgins Hotel and Conference Center that just opened in the, the last part of 2019. Um, we had uh, almost 600 people uh, working on our campus every single day. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, over 450 volunteers that uh, give at least four hours of their time every week. Um, that number is much lower right now. Uh, we had to lay off about one third uh, of our staff um, as we you know, looked at the, the realities of you know, the impacts of the pandemic and what we anticipate will be a, a challenging recovery. Um, but in many ways, we're fortunate there will there will be as many as a quarter of the museums in this country probably not come out of this. That's what we, we hear at this point. Um, and I know that as we get into the later stages of the recovery, we will be able to build back this team. And my hope is in the next two to three years, we'll get back to those numbers that we had uh, pre-COVID. Another question from Marvin. Are you aware of the LPB interview project on uh, what World War II veterans? Yes. Absolutely. And we've actually, we've had a great partnership with LPB over the years. Um, we've actually produced a couple of uh, documentaries uh, with Beth and and, uh, uh, and her team. So we absolutely are. Yes. That's great. Gentlemen, cannot thank you enough for your, your time uh, and, and, and stories and information you've, you've shared with us today. Uh, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Baton Rouge, I just want to say thank you again for, for both of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Have a great day. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you uh, once again uh, next Wednesday, the August 12th, the Rotor Club. Our speaker will be Scott Alswang. He's going to talk to us about the, the secrets of the United States Secret Service. And then coming up on August 19th, we'll be doing a blood drive at back at Drusilla, and uh, you'll be getting more information about that. Please come out and donate some blood. That being said, thank you all very much for attending. Have a great day. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC.